Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Chuck Burrows, and uh, welcome this afternoon to our Bucks County Orthopedic Specialist Facebook live session. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, joint replacement. Uh, I am a fellowship trained hip and knee replacement surgeon who's been practicing in the Doylestown community for greater than 20 years, and I am the medical director of the Orthopedic Institute at Doylestown Hospital and also am one of the staff physicians at Bucks County Surgical Suites. Um, basically what we're going to talk about today is hip and knee replacement and obviously we'll touch a little bit on how to deal with uh, hip and knee arthritis during the pandemic. Uh, as many of you know, uh, elective surgeries have been significantly curtailed due to the diversion of healthcare resources to coronavirus patients. And at this point, we're doing uh, a great deal of conservative management for patients with severe hip and knee arthritis to get them through this difficult time. Um, some questions that uh, have been sent to us prior to uh, today's forum is uh, one how uh, from Nancy W. How do I distinguish the pain uh, from hip arthritis uh, versus labral tear in the hip, and how are the treatments of those two conditions difficult or uh, not difficult? Excuse me, different. Um, with respect to hip arthritis, uh, one of the easiest ways to diagnose uh, arthritis in the hip is with a plain x-ray. Uh, x-rays of the hip uh, in patients who have arthritis will show joint space narrowing. Uh, they may also show deformity of the round portion of the femoral head, which we call the ball of the hip. And there may also be cysts or areas of cartilage loss with fluid underneath around the joint surfaces of the hip. And there may be other things such as subchondral sclerosis, which shows us uh, changes of density uh, in the bone around the hip. Uh, a labral tear, or what the hip labrum is, is it's a cartilage structure that is between the ball and socket of the hip. And a labral tear cannot be seen on a plain x-ray. And to define or identify a labral tear, one needs to undergo MRI examination. Um, in terms of the treatment for the two, uh, labral tears of the hip are often uh, treated with non-surgical management. One of the first uh, modalities that's used to treat uh, labral tears are uh, anti-inflammatory injections, either orally uh, or injectable uh, medications. Uh, and other uh, ways of treating labral tears that are uh, refractory to non-surgical treatment is uh, hip arthroscopy. That being said, I'd say the vast majority of uh, labral tears respond to hip injections. Uh, in our uh, office, we have two excellent uh, interventional doctors, uh, Dr. Ninad Stelikar and Dr. Sean Butler, and they are the two doctors that are uh, employed most frequently to provide hip injections to patients with labral tears. Uh, they're excellent at this uh, procedure, and uh, they do the vast majority of these procedures uh, with ultrasound or uh, x-ray slash fluoroscopic guidance. Uh, another question from uh, Josh S. Uh, Josh S. is asking, what are the differences between the surgical approaches that are offered for uh, hip and knee replacement? And uh, ask me just to, to touch on that topic. Um, hip replacement uh, has been done uh, in the United States for many years. The original a surgical approach was rather invasive. It was what was called a direct lateral approach, which would be through a very large incision. It involved removal of one of the major bony prominences of the hip called the greater trochanter. And the recovery from that operation was uh, quite protracted. Uh, so orthopedic surgeons in the 1970s and 1980s began to look at different ways to approach the hip that were less invasive in nature and provided quicker recovery. Uh, what I refer to as the workhorse uh, approach to hip surgery and hip replacement is called the posterior approach, and that is still the most uh, popular approach uh, in the United States. Uh, that approach uh, can be done efficiently, is associated with a very low risk for uh, nerve damage, and also a very low risk for leg length discrepancy, meaning one leg being longer or shorter after the operation. 
Um, approximately 10 years ago, there was a big push into rapid recovery protocols for hip replacement. And around that same time, the anterior approach became popular. And the anterior approach uh, is just done through the front of the hip rather than through the side or back of the hip as a traditional posterior approach. And uh, early on had a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, it is still used by many uh, orthopedic surgeons today, uh, but they have seen uh, higher complication rates with the anterior approach. And the vast majority of uh, orthopedic surgeons in our region are still using the posterior approach as the main and successful approach for hip replacement surgery. Just to talk about the evolution of hip replacement surgery, uh, hip replacements uh, have changed dramatically in the 20 years that I have been at Doylestown Hospital. When we were doing hip replacements back in the late 1990s, the uh, patient uh, would go from the operating room to the recovery room and then would have a hospital stay that was often two to seven days. And then from there often go to a long uh, protracted stay in a rehabilitation facility. As techniques in both surgery and anesthesia have evolved, uh, hip replacement has turned into a much quicker operation with respect to the time in the operating room as well as the uh, post-operative recovery period. Many of our patients today are being done as outpatients or with a less than one day surgical stay and it is very rare that a patient would require inpatient rehabilitation after joint replacement. In other words, most patients have their surgery, are in the hospital, and then will go home the same day or the following day and begin an outpatient physical therapy program. Um, Jocelyn M. had specifically asked that question, uh, stating, if I am scheduled for a hip replacement, am I better to go to uh, inpatient rehab or outpatient physical therapy? And I think the answer to that clearly is outpatient physical therapy. Uh, inpatient rehab uh, is not recommended by most orthopedic surgeons for a few reasons. Number one, it's just not necessary. Most patients are able to recover well at home. And number two, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, many of them house uh, patients who are sick or medically ill. And when one is having a hip replacement, uh, you're not ill, you have a sore hip and I would prefer and I hope you would prefer to recover at home in an environment where you are not exposed to or around sick people. So I, I strongly feel that for the vast majority of patients, uh, outpatient rehab is the most appropriate course. Rebecca N. asked a question, uh, how long can you expect a hip replacement to last? That's a great, great question, one I get nearly every day. Uh, years ago when we saw patients, we'd often tell them to expect five, possibly uh, 10 years out of a hip replacement surgery. Uh, we found that was a gross uh, underestimate of the long-term uh, life expectancy of hip replacements. Uh, today, we find that the vast majority of hip replacements are lasting 20 to 30 years or longer. And our hope is in most of our patients that what they uh, are getting is what we call a lifetime hip replacement. And what I mean by that is that they have one operation and they no longer need to have additional operations uh, on that hip for the rest of their uh, natural life. Um, just to talk a little bit about what we're doing today in the uh, coronavirus era, um, we are uh, not performing elective hip and knee replacement, um, but we are expecting uh, to get uh, back into the operating room for procedures of this type in May or or June of this year, so I don't think it's going to be uh, that much longer. Uh, many of our patients we're managing non-surgically, uh, some with injection therapy, uh, some with oral pain medicines, uh, and some with uh, exercise routines. Uh, and I'm sure many of you are uh, eager to see uh, our elective surgical practice uh, resume uh, so that you no longer have significant pain. I was just handed another question from Jed P. Uh, I was scheduled to have a total hip replacement that got postponed. What can I do during the time to non-surgically treat myself with meds and exercises? Again, we just we briefly touched on that, but many patients uh, will manage their pain with uh, oral medications. Uh, medications we prefer would be non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, common over-the-counter 
options are Advil or Aleve. Uh, Tylenol is also a great uh, pain medication that one can use to help manage day-to-day -day pain from arthritis. If these modalities are not successful, you can contact your physician and uh, sometimes we can use uh, other prescription pain medicines that may be more suitable for your condition. In terms of exercise, uh, it's a great idea. There are a lot of self-guided uh, exercises that can be performed uh, to help with the pain from hip arthritis. Uh, formal physical therapy is something we uh, often use uh, in patients who have hip arthritis but aren't quite ready or don't quite need to consider hip replacement surgery. But at this time, I probably would discourage that for most patients uh, due to the COVID epidemic. And I would say probably working on a home exercise program would be great. Uh, you certainly could contact our office uh, or you could contact Fitness Physical Therapy. Uh, they have two offices in Doylestown and Warrington. Uh, any one of those three uh, organizations would be happy to provide you with information on non-surgical uh, exercises for hip and or knee arthritis. Uh, also, uh, there are a lot of online resources that one could seek out for uh, other exercises that would be appropriate. Uh, Deb G, uh, what can a patient do to protect themselves from COVID-19 if they have to have surgery during this time? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the, the main issues to protect yourself is to avoid having surgery at this time. So as we stated earlier, we're really avoiding elective surgeries, but at this time we uh, still have emergencies, so still have patients uh, that surgical treatment cannot be avoided even during the uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, hospitals right now are taking extreme precautions to care for patients during this time. Um, you may have heard of the coveted N95 mask. Uh, those are being worn uh, in the OR by members of the surgical team to uh, prevent uh, disease transmission either to or from the patient. Uh, the volume of surgeries being done is uh, significantly curtailed, so there's less traffic in the operating room. And also deep cleaning procedures are being used to make sure that the operating room theater is as clean as possible to prevent disease transmission. Uh, these factors, and probably some that didn't immediately come to mind, are all being employed, and uh, we certainly are doing our best uh, to prevent any uh, emergency orthopedic patient from becoming ill. Uh, Robert G, can knee and hip replacement be done at the same time on the same leg? Uh, that's a great question. So the answer to that specific question is no. We generally do not recommend doing a hip replacement and knee replacement at the same setting or same surgical time. We do do bilateral knee replacements at the same time. And what I mean by that is we will do a right and left knee replacement on the same day. Uh, but that probably is appropriate for only the most well patients without a lot of uh, what we call comorbidities or a lot of other outstanding health issues. Uh, bilateral hip replacement, meaning both hips on the same day, uh, that procedure used to be done with some frequency, but most studies that have looked at it have suggested that the uh, risks of having a medical complication from doing two hips at the same time or during the same uh, surgical experience is greater than the risks of doing one hip one day and another hip at some point in the future, possibly six weeks later or further down the road. So again, uh, would not recommend doing a knee and hip replacement on the same leg at the same time. Uh, that being said, uh, we have a lot of things at our fingertips today to reduce uh, blood loss in the operating room. We have uh, excellent hypotensive anesthesia, which keeps the blood pressure low to minimize blood loss. And these factors combined allow patients to have a hip replacement done and then come back in a matter of weeks to get their second surgery uh, knee replacement if needed. Um, do we have any other questions, Randy, at this point in time? No, at this time. Okay. Um, just to touch a little bit on um, the process of hip replacement and what that looks like um, in the non-COVID uh, period. Uh, 
Um, patients who uh, have hip pain or hip arthritis uh, often will present to our office and we will uh, bring them back and usually get some x-rays immediately. Uh, and we typically get an x-ray of the pelvis and then some focused views on the hip of concern. Uh, we like to review those x-rays with you, the patient, uh, to determine what the next treatment is. Uh, many patients who have hip arthritis don't have to immediately consider hip replacement. It's only those with uh, significant disease. So at that point, after reviewing the x-rays, we'll get some history from you, talk about what things you've tried, be it medications, exercises, and or physical therapy, as well as discuss uh, things such as family history. Uh, many patients who have hip arthritis uh, often note that they have siblings or parents who have struggled with the same condition at some point during their lives. Uh, once that process of history uh, taking has been completed, we often move on to what we call the physical examination and we'll bring your hip through a range of motion. I find this to be the most beneficial part of the examination uh, for the patient and for myself in terms of getting to the bottom of why their hip hurts. There are a few things that we see on a physical examination, specifically pain with internal rotation of the hip. And when that's seen, uh, that definitely indicates to us that you have some significant hip pathology. Uh, if the physical examination uh, and x-rays and history all point to uh, Hip arthritis, we can then go on to talk about uh, treatment modalities and some of the ones we've touched on earlier may be physical therapy, it may be injection therapy, uh, or it may be total hip replacement. Um, if we don't have the answers we need at that stage, we may consider getting an MRI and then seeing you back in our office after an MRI evaluation, which can give us some higher resolution images of the hip to better understand uh, why you're in pain. When one is considering hip replacement, um, the process goes as follows. We introduce you to one of our surgery schedulers and those people help you find a date for surgery. We will then order a series of what are called PATs, which means pre-admission tests, which typically consist of blood tests and an EKG. Uh, that information is then sent to your family doctor and or your cardiologist if you have a cardiac history. And basically what we want those two individuals to do is uh, review your tests and give you a physical examination and let us know from a medical standpoint if you are in good physical condition or in the optimum physical condition to undergo a procedure like hip replacement. Uh, assuming all that goes as planned, uh, we then We'll meet you in the operating room. Uh, the two places we do hip replacements are Doylestown Hospital. We do uh, inpatient uh, procedures there as well as outpatient uh, hip replacement there. And the decision for that uh, may be made in conjunction with you and your physician, uh, as well as with input from the uh, cardiologist or internal medicine team that manages your care. If one is electing for outpatient surgery, that surgery is uh, usually performed very early in the morning. Uh, you go back to a recovery area where you are met with a physical therapist and you are gotten out of bed usually within an hour of the conclusion of the operation. Uh, we make sure that you're able to ambulate effectively around the post-operative care area with a walker. Generally send you home where you will meet with a physical therapist who will meet you at home and make sure you're safe navigating around your house and getting up and down the stairs if necessary. That home physical therapy typically goes for two to three days, and then you are transitioned to an outpatient physical therapy program two to three times per week. Uh, we also do outpatient uh, joint replacement at Bucks County Surgical Suites. Uh, those patients that go there are among our most physically fit and most healthy patients. They uh, generally are in the facility for a period of about total four, hour, total four hours, and that includes the uh, intake procedure, the administration of anesthesia, the operation, and then subsequent physical therapy in the post-operative area. Uh, those patients then uh, are sent home from the surgical center, uh, usually in the early afternoon, and again, meeting physical therapists at their house and then rapidly progressing to an outpatient uh, program. 
Many patients ask how long uh, does it take to recover from hip replacement? And uh, I think that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but I think the best answer I can provide patients is, is, is a staged answer. In other words, most patients at six weeks are about 65% improved. Most patients at three months are 85% improved. But you'll still get improvement in strength and endurance that occurs for a year to 18 months after the operation. Uh, that being said, I find the vast majority of my patients are, are back to a, a somewhat normal way of living within six weeks uh, uh, after the operation. Uh, Wendy S. has sent uh, a question, uh, what precautions is your office taking to protect patients from COVID and will you see me now? Uh, that's a great question. Well, I am actually speaking to you from my office, which is empty. Uh, and that's probably the first precaution we're taking. We are uh, not seeing many of our patients at this time to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We, as uh, providers, and that is all of the physicians and physician assistants within our organization are doing a large amount of telemedicine. And what that involves is video conferencing uh, throughout the day with our patients, uh, as well as uh, doing uh, phone calls with patients that don't have the ability to communicate uh, by computer, uh, iPhone, iPad, or a similar device. Uh, I think that this has been a great resource that we have quickly adapted uh, during this time period because uh, there is no safer place to be than in your home at this time. And many uh, patient questions can be answered uh, in the home through telemedicine. Um, things we're doing in, with patients that need to come to our office, we're insisting that all of our patients uh, wear masks when they present to the office. Uh, we are trying to limit uh, the amount of visitors to our office. In other words, we are only having patients in the waiting room uh, without their families and usually only one patient at a time. Uh, our staff uh, is also taking uh, extreme precautions to prevent disease transmission in terms of the cleanliness they're offering in our office and also limiting the number of patients that are in the office uh, at a time. And I, I have to say I'm very proud of all the people that uh, uh, I'm working with. Uh, they've really uh, risen to the challenges that have uh, faced us during this COVID pandemic. Uh, the next uh, or second part of Wendy S's question is, will you see me now? Uh, we certainly could consider seeing you now. We would be happy to see you as a video telemedicine visit. Uh, if you do have uh, emergency or intractable pain, we would uh, certainly find a way to see you uh, within the uh, walls of our office. We have another uh, question from Lauren G. Do you perform cementless knee replacements? Um, I have performed cementless knee replacements. I'm, I'm not at this time, and I don't believe that I'm going to be anytime soon. Um, I do a lot of cementless hip replacements, uh, but the reason I don't do cementless knee replacements is cemented knee replacement is still the gold standard. I have yet to see a long-term study on cementless knee replacements, which shows that the durability of those devices is as good or better than the durability of cemented knee replacements. So that being said, at this point, uh, myself and uh, my colleagues at Bucks County Orthopedic Specialists, we all still feel very strongly that uh, state-of-the-art care in knee replacement is with a cemented design. In hip replacement, uh, the opposite is true. The vast majority of hip replacements that we do today are done without cement in an uncemented technique, and that's because the results of those devices have been shown to be excellent. Tracy C., could you touch on physical limitations after total hip surgery? Um, well, one of the first things I like to tell patients when I get asked that question is don't think about how you're going to be limited by hip replacement. Think about the things that you're going to be able to do. Uh, most patients, when they get to the point that they're considering a total hip replacement, they're finding it difficult to uh, ambulate even short distances having pain with activities like ascending and descending stairs, and what we call ADLs, or activities of daily living, become increasingly more and more difficult. And I often tell patients the time to consider hip replacement is when you can't do the things that you and your family want to do together. So after hip replacement, most patients are able to do far more than they were able to do before they had the surgery. 
In the immediate post-operative period, there are some positions we'd like you to avoid, uh, such as bending past 90 degrees and twisting. Uh, those hip precautions are continued for a rather short period of time, and then patients are able to get on with an active, uh, vibrant lifestyle. So that was a great question, Tracy, and thank you for asking it. Are there any other questions for us, Randy? Um, what are the differences between anterior and posterior approaches for hips? We already we touched on that a little bit about the different approaches and, and the, the advantages of, uh, of one versus the other. Do they impact recovery time? So no, I think that's a good question. So is there a difference in the recovery time between anterior and posterior approach? And Early on, it was felt that the anterior approach had a quicker recovery time. That's actually uh, been shown not to be true. Uh, anterior approach uh, became popular during the time period that rapid recovery uh, hip replacement surgery uh, came into vogue. And what we found that uh, we were able to do very many outpatient hip replacements throughout the year using a posterior approach. And what I mean by that is patients are able to come in to the surgery center or to the hospital, have an operation, and then be at home within four hours uh, and on their way to recovery. So uh, I do not feel that uh, the anterior approach or posterior approach uh, offers an advantage in that regard. Nancy W. asks, can arthritis in the hip result in periodic dislocation? Arthritis in the hip does not generally cause dislocation, but it can cause a uh, problem called subluxation. And what that means is uh, dislocation is where the ball completely comes out of the joint. That's a very unusual uh, finding in a patient with hip arthritis. It's generally a traumatic finding after high energy accidents like uh, motor vehicle accidents or uh, falls from a significant height. Uh, hip subluxation means that the ball starts to slide out of the joint but doesn't completely dislodge from the joint. And uh, hip subluxations uh, can happen, especially if one has advanced hip arthritis where the sphericity or round shape of the ball portion of the hip is no longer present. Robert GS, how long before you can drive and do stairs? Uh, great question. Stairs, uh, I get that question every day. Uh, most people in our region have stairs in their home. And I tell patients that you can go up and down the stairs the night of surgery. In other words, I don't feel that I could send you home uh, the same day after a hip replacement and have you go up to your bedroom and not be able to get back down the stairs the following morning or if you needed to in an emergency. So stairs are generally, uh, for the vast majority of patients, it's something they can do immediately after the operation. Uh, when physical therapists meet with you, uh, either in the recovery area or in the hospital room on the day of your surgery, after surgery, one of the first questions they will ask you is, do you have stairs in your home? And if you do, they're going to start working with you on stair sets in the therapy center or in your house to make sure that you're comfortable getting up and down stairs. What was the second part of that question? Uh, driving. Oh, driving. Um, driving after a hip replacement, it, uh, you have to first of all ask which hip it is, the right or the left hip. With respect to a right hip replacement, it takes a little longer. And the reason is the right hip in an automatic transmission car needs to have excellent muscular function for moving from the gas pedal to the brake pedal. Uh, for many patients, they're back to driving in a period of weeks. Uh, with respect to left hip replacement, I find many of my patients are back to driving in only two to three weeks. What, uh, this comes from Nancy. What can a patient do to minimize sub sublocation, and will this be eliminated by hip replacement? Um, in terms of minimizing subluxation before hip replacement, one of the best modalities is physical therapy. Uh, by strengthening the muscles around the hip, that will provide a better sense of stability uh, for your hip. Uh, also, a patient who does struggle with subluxation prior to hip replacement, uh, those patients find their hip tends to feel much more stable after the uh, hip replacement procedure has been performed. Any other questions? Well, I think we've uh, been on the air for about half an hour. Uh, I just wanted to, to thank all of you for tuning in. Thanks for uh, a lot of the great questions. Um, I, again, I want to emphasize that I'm just one of many of the peop many people working here at Bucks County Orthopedic Specialists. We've we've got just a fabulous team of administrative people, physicians, physician assistants, and uh, 
people who will work in our office taking x-rays, medical assistants, surgery schedulers, and on down the line. I can't tell you um, how fortunate I am to have as great a team as we've uh, gotten here at Bucks County Orthopedic Specialists. Uh, even though I'm a hip and knee replacement specialist, I'm only a small part of what happens at Bucks County Orthopedic Specialists. We have uh, other very talented people. Uh, Dr. Cody, who I've worked with for 20 years, is a sports uh, medicine specialist. Uh, also, Dr. Boylan uh, is another one of our sports medicine specialists. Uh, I think I earlier I mentioned uh, two uh, interventionalists. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Ninad Stelikar and Dr. Sean Butler. The two of them are uh, are injection specialists. They uh, are people who provide the care for a lot of our patients with uh, back issues as well as other joint issues. Uh, with respect to joint replacement, I'm one of three uh, hip and knee replacement specialists that we have in our practice. It's uh, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Thomas Vicorn, uh, who uh, is an excellent uh, resource for hip and knee replacement in the community, as is uh, Joshua Steer. Uh, Josh Steer is uh, one of our newest uh, physicians, and he does a marvelous job with respect to the management of uh, our hip and knee replacement patients. Um, Susan Griffith is our uh, pediatric orthopedic specialist and is certainly here uh, for the needs of the uh, children in our community and uh, I'm sure is quite busy during this coronavirus pandemic with uh, all these kids being cooped up in their houses and uh, creating havoc at home. Uh, we also have um, uh, several other uh, uh, people uh, working in our office that are uh, just excellent. Michelle Horn is a family practice doctor uh, who also uh, is a sports uh, medicine specialist as well and deals with the non-operative treatment of sports medicine, has additional training in osteoporosis management, and is really um, uh, a great a talent and a great resource uh, for our practice. Our physician's assistants, uh, they do a wonderful job. Uh, there's no way that I could perform uh, the level of care uh, to our community without uh, them being here on a day-to-day -day basis, and they have really uh, stepped up and really helped out during this uh, difficult uh, coronavirus pandemic. I don't think I forgot anybody, did I? Are we anyone else? Oh yeah, we've got, uh, totally forgot, our, our hand surgery program with uh, uh, Dr. Park. Uh, Dr. Park has been here for years. Uh, he is wonderful for uh, not just hand, but upper extremity problems. And then uh, also one of our newest additions, additions is Dr. Peacock. He is a foot and ankle specialist and uh, is trained with a wonderful uh, background in Philadelphia and can manage nearly any foot and ankle problem that comes to our door. So again, um, just want to give a shout out to all the people working uh, on our team. Uh, I really feel to that I have a great group of individuals with me uh, that continue to provide care here in the Doylestown community. Thank you uh, very much and uh, thanks for attending our Facebook Live session. I'm Dr. Charles Burroughs. Bye-bye.